Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 215 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I am a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book came out in November on Amazon. Check that out. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. Go and check that out. Now, we call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there's nothing like great food to bring fraternity and sorority leaders together. Fun fact, just like our next guest, harm reduction is something that's really important to me. It's what we started Greek University with back in 2015. At that time, I was talking about hazing prevention, sexual assault prevention, alcohol and drug abuse prevention, and I quickly realized that I wasn't the expert in everything. So we started adding other speakers in new areas like mental health, recruitment, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and much, much more. So this gives us the ability to help just about anybody on any college campus. Let us know if we can help you and also let us know if there's a topic that you want on your campus that we don't have because we're always looking to stay relevant and up to date with the needs of college students. So our next guest, I am so excited. This is Emily Rose Jacobson. Emily Rose is the Director of Harm Reduction at Alpha Chi Omega Fraternity Incorporated and has been in a harm reduction role for their headquarters for almost five years. She's a proud graduate of Middle Tennessee State University. She has her Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration from LSU, Louisiana State University. She's also a great friend to so many folks in the Greek university circles. So I just couldn't wait to get her on the show. Welcome to the show, Emily Rose. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here and, and I'm just excited to be a part of you know the podcast world. Oh my goodness, what a great opportunity. It is. It is a great opportunity. You know, I just saw so many great people in fraternity and sorority life and you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they're no longer in this world for whatever reason. And so I was just like, you know, there's so many greats that we stand on their shoulders. And I wanted to make sure that we documented all of the great people in fraternity and sorority life. So that way future generations have the opportunity to hear them in their own words. I thought it was so important to capture that while we still had that opportunity. So for me, it's just kind of like documenting some of the great people that we get to work with all the time. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've enjoyed listening to the episodes and I'm really honored to be a part of the ranks of the folks that you, you've asked to be part of your podcast. Absolutely. Well, you absolutely belong here. Let me tell you that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about your background. I know that you decided on MTSU for your undergraduate experience, which is really near and dear to my heart because I do a ton of work for their Center for Health and Human Services. And my son is looking at that campus. He wants to stay close to home. So there's so many connections there. But what made MTSU the right choice for you? Yeah, well, MTSU is a great school, so so glad we shared that connection uh, with with you know the Blue Raiders. I so I went to high school in Ohio, um, and so when I was graduating, I was really looking at schools in Ohio, and then had a little bit of an interest in Tennessee, uh, but was actually really at a place of thinking that I was going to go to Bowling Green State University, and was feeling pretty good about that decision. Then I learned my dad was going to be transferring to a location in Tennessee for work, um, was going to be living in Knoxville, working out of the secret city, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And so that opened the door to, okay, maybe I should further explore this Tennessee thing uh, to see if there is a fit that I would like uh, to stay closer to my parents. So I went on a little tour of four different uh, universities in Tennessee and MTSU was the last one that I saw and it was just that click fit. It just felt like this is what college is like. This is what it's supposed to feel like. I loved that the campus is what I would describe as like insular to itself. So you see all the campus things when you're walking around and it's not necessarily mixed in with other types of businesses or other buildings throughout it. So to me, having that feel of this is college, this is where you go to school, this is where you live, this is where you make friends was all right there. And it had similarities to Bowling Green. So I could see the transferability of like, okay, this could be the right fit. Um, and I'm so grateful that it was. And I got to be three hours down the road from my parents, which was nice during that time. So some distance, um, but also could go home for weekends, those kinds of things. And, and it was great. It worked out very, very well. 
obviously it worked out great for you. And it's so interesting too, because I just feel like you're like a native Tennessean. Like, <laughs> you know, you're talking about Ohio. I'm like, Ohio. I'm like, no. didn't she just like always like live here in Tennessee? That's what I would assume, right? <laughs> I know. And I think the accent part got me a little yeah. bit. So now sometimes when I'm working on different college campuses, they're like, we can hear it. When you say you went to MTSU, like we can hear it. But I'm like, but I've lived in like Kansas and Washington state and Ohio and like, okay, I don't know. My voice just kind of became a, a Southern voice of, of sorts. <laughs> I think you're right. I think it's the accent that just throws me off. I'm like, oh, she's a Tennessean. She's born here. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. And you chose Alpha Chi Omega. You eventually served as chapter president, VP of recruitment for the sorority. So what made Alpha Chi Omega the right sorority for you? Yeah. So at MTSU, when, when I went through the recruitment process, it happened about uh, six weeks after school started. And I was that true like out of state student dynamic where I didn't know anyone on campus. And I also lived in a residence hall room by myself. So I really had to find where is going to be my friend group, where are going to be my people. And so sorority recruitment felt like maybe it's there. Uh, I really didn't know like what would come or if it would be something that I would even really stick with. I don't consider myself like a quitter, uh, but I was like, I, let me just try it and see. I don't have like a Greek family experience where that wasn't something I heard about growing up of having a fraternity sorority experience, but it was really the friendship piece and the opportunity that existed. And going through the process, um, it really then became about the people, the idea of what fraternity and sorority often talks about of people join people and the right people were the ones I were meeting throughout the process with Alpha Chi Omega. And I can specifically identify the names of the women I spoke to that I could see like, these are going to be my friends. These are going to be the people who will be mentors. These are people who will support me that I can picture having um, serious conversations with, but also having fun with. And, and all of that really just aligned for me. Uh, and so was so blessed to have the opportunity to join Alpha Chi Omega. And so that was kind of like the recruiting experience. But then I do think there's a lot to be said about the new member process and that period where you continue to explore what's the fit, how do I come into this fold and what is the chapter offering me? What am I offering the chapter? And so I loved that exploratory time of being in that new member phase. Um, and so when getting to learn more about the chapter dynamic, I learned that at the time the chapter was only nine years old, which I thought was so cool. I think there's so much to be said for what tradition and history can look like and can accurately mean in an organization. And I loved that with being a younger chapter, we had some understanding that we were a part of a bigger picture. We had a chapter advisor that was from a different chapter of initiation, had some um, really great rapport with our headquarters, right? So I had some of that understanding of what it's like to be a part of the bigger picture, but then also something that is really special and growing and establishing its legacy on a campus. And all of that just spoke to me. And I, I, felt so supported by the women who were going through the process with me, who were the initiated members of the chapter. Um, and I will say during that new member period, I had those feelings of like, I want to be on this chapter's exec board. And that commitment set in so naturally for me um, and, and turned out to be just the best experience and uh, loved every minute of my four years. I love how you describe the people who made you want to join them. And in your mind, you could picture them because that just goes to the point that, yes, people join people. You didn't join Alpha Chi Omega because of an event that they were putting on. It was the people you wanted to hang out with them. So if we just focus on relationships as opposed to the big event, then maybe we'll get somewhere. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So the flashiness of recruitment can be there. Sure. Um, but the, but how we have meaningful conversations and build those connections, oh, it just it just matters so much. Yeah, it's those connections. So just be real, be authentic, and those connections, that's ultimately what's going to bring in droves of people into your organization. If you can be really authentic and develop those one-on-one -on -one relationships, then you've got it. You know, don't worry about spending a ton of money or all the flash. I mean, I see all of that stuff and I'm like, you don't even need it, but okay. <laughs> Yep, yep, totally agree. <laughs> now, you've been working for Alpha Chi Omega's headquarters or executive offices for almost five years now. You've had this focus on harm reduction, which really resonates with me. What is it like to work for your sorority headquarters? What types of things have you, have you been working on in this role of harm reduction? 
Yeah, so when I first graduated from college, I worked for the organization for a year as a chapter consultant. So loved that that role, right, is is so interesting for many national organizations as they kind of serve as a jack of all trades uh, for their headquarters staff. So you get to do a little bit of everything. And so I loved the like recruitment piece, but I always had the natural lean towards like the chapter operations side of things and towards the difficult conversations of how are we going to move forward and how are we going to have like a healthy, wonderful, productive experience. And so I always knew, I always had this feeling of like, if I ever come back to headquarters staff, if I ever have that opportunity, I hope it's in the risk management harm reduction space. Um, and so I went to grad school, as you mentioned, um, and, and then the the stars aligned and the position in the risk management space was available uh, about the time I was graduating and um, was just so lucky to come back. And so at the time it was uh, the risk management position in the organization. And I will say over the years that I've been here now, about that five years, harm reduction has really come into focus for our organization and has developed so significantly and has been built out within our collegiate experience services with our chapters and i think a lot of that right was the whole or the whole industry kind of went through a reckoning around that 2017 time where there was so much tragedy happening in the fraternity sorority industry and then it, everybody i think was having to figure out like how how are we bringing this into focus and how are we having really good intentional conversations about what is the sustainability of fraternity and sorority and how do we bring all of its good to the forefront um, and and make that a priority and so through the through the past few years harm reduction has become its its own piece within alpha chi omega's collegiate experience space and we have done a lot from looking at what are our policies? How do we refresh them? How do we make them digestible? How do we deliver um, event planning and support materials to chapters so that they can be thinking about environment setup? And um, we've looked at mental health pieces differently than I think ever before, as many uh, entities that work with higher education institutions have done, as that continues to be a piece that is evolving in some ways in really great ways where students are uh, more interested or more open, I should say, in that conversation. But then also looking for where are the resources, where are the ways that we can build out and provide a foundation for those strong conversations to take place. So that's become a big focus area with things like uh, introducing the Behind Happy Faces uh, program that many organizations use now and looking at how do we build out other support mechanisms and designate space on our website and in our communication to chapters around the prioritization of mental health has been a big piece. While also knowing that uh, a lot of things in the risk management space for fraternity sororities hasn't necessarily changed a ton over the past many decades of what needs to continue to be at a focal point in discussions, things like alcohol, hazing. Um, so those continues to be continue to be areas that we are building out a lot of programs, resources, materials um, for chapters in and thinking about even having the VP risk management for our organization has been a, a returning officer to our leadership academy programming and having a, a health and safety summit over the summer and, and thinking about how do we continue to have developmental conversations so that it continues to be natural language for our chapters within our chapter within our chapters um, has been a big part of my work and working in the harm reduction space. Um, and then, of course, also thinking about how are we providing direct chapter support. So I'm also doing a lot of talking to chapters, as is, as is my team member, um, and how we work with them specifically through issues that they're identifying or that come to our radar attention of how do we um, move the needle and perhaps get to a place where some chapter culture can come into place are all pieces of, of moving the organization collectively forward. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the pandemic and how that has shaped um, about two years of my working time with Alpha Chi in this space and having to pivot and put energy and effort into how do we continue to sustain and provide good, healthy, safe, also now like medically safe, right, experiences um, for our collegiate chapters. And so having to put um, some intention into the resources and the conversation and the guidance that we provide chapters, particularly around how do we continue to build um, support and sisterly experiences while knowing that we've had to do that in modified ways and we've had to continue to adjust 
And sometimes that has provided additional disappointment um, that the pandemic has, has brought on for everyone. Um, and sometimes we've been able to really find creative outlets uh, for having those, those great um, connection points and inclusive experiences continue to happen while students are also balancing a really unique time to have a college experience. So um, all of that is kind of the sprinklings of what it's been like to be in my role the past five years, but I really love working uh, at headquarters and a lot of that has to do with the staff team. Uh, it is a hardworking, high achieving, smart, creative group of people and um, certainly push me to be to be better and think differently and more all the time. So it's 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 been such a great journey so far. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I hope that every fraternity and sorority listens to that because I think your focus is so important at an executive office level. And I hope that everybody has those kind of resources or finds a way to get those kinds of resources at headquarters staff because uh, it's just so critical. And speaking of that, I, I know you do ASTP training. So what is this training program, ASTP? And and how does it change behavior on college campuses? Yeah, so ASCP is the Alcohol Skills Training Program. Um, again, a number of national organizations or college campuses use the program. And to a point you made earlier, right? I, I can't be the, the person who knows everything about all of these topics. These are big topics. Mm -hmm. So leaning on folks who are experts um, and researchers of these different um, really difficult issues is certainly something that we lean on uh, from a research-based perspective of how we approach education and ASTP is one of those. So um, ASTP developed by the late Alan uh, Marlette and Dr. Jason Kilmore and other folks at the University of Washington created a, this program, which really is rooted in motivational conversation with students about if we provide information to you that tells you facts and, and research-based information about what alcohol is, how it works, how it impacts the body, and we break that down uh, into digestible pieces of conversation, can we get students to a place of perhaps making decisions or changing behavior or being more conscious of their decisions based on what they know about how alcohol works. Of course, there are things like, you know, the law that tells us that you should be 21 or older to drink, but that alone isn't going to change behavior. That alone isn't going to produce safer results. So it's, it's um, an effort to say, if we can understand how alcohol works and what its impact would be if I'm a person that chooses to drink, um, can I make the best informed decisions that will keep me safe, keep my friends safe, keep the experiences of being in environments where alcohol consumption is taking place safe, will probably be in a better place. And so that, that program has been a part of Alpha Chi Omega's fold of uh, educational programs for a number of years. And, and I am one of the facilitators for it for Alpha Chi and I love getting to facilitate the program. I tell students, I promise you will learn something. I understand that most college students at this point have heard something about alcohol education at some point during their time in college. Um, but this program really takes such a great approach of really thinking about how, how do you understand alcohol, standard drink, assessing it, um, and then really thinking through what are risk reduction steps then. Now that you know this information, how do we put it all together and then hopefully create some, some good safe behavior change decisions based on that educational experience. Um, and many, many, many of our members provide such positive reviews about that experience as it is such a different approach to alcohol education that isn't just rooted in like abstinence or isn't just rooted in the law says this, um, but provides real, real information um, to make informed decisions that you believe are best for you. I love it. It's a great tool that you're offering. So I think that's fantastic. And it certainly does impact some of the other areas that we talk about in risk yep. management, sexual assault, hazing. I mean, you can really kind of draw a map and draw a line from some of those issues um, and connect them. Um, and speaking of sexual assaults, this has been in the headlines on college campuses, uh, very prevalent, I would say, over the last year. Um, there's been all kinds of protests on the front lawns of fraternity houses all across the country. How can fraternity fraternity men flip this narrative and actually be the ones to solve this problem that we're seeing on college campuses? Yeah, uh, such a good question. <laughs> and I think a couple things foundationally when, when I think about that and, and knowing that there may be a lot of perspectives and mine is certainly just one, but for me, I think about the reality that between 20 and 25% of college women will experience sexual misconduct at some point during their time as a college student. And that is a huge burden to have as a student and to think about that that number of one in you know four one in five and and that potential and also understanding that 
men are not the only people who can be perpetrators of sexual misconduct, but what, what statistics tell us is around 90%, a little bit greater, of um, sexual misconduct is perpetrated by men. And so I, I think seeing that through the lens of, of in the interpretation that can sometimes be a part of societal norms of like it's a women's issue or something, then we have to figure out how to tell the women how to keep themselves safe is not the right message when the folks who are the perpetrators are men. And so taking that on is like, men, what are you gonna do about this? And what behavior change will you uh, provide on a college campus so that there's less likelihood that a woman is gonna experience sexual misconduct? I, I hope is where our conversation will, will go uh, as a society and as a, an industry. And so to your question of what can college men do then about that? Well, I, I think about the instances you're talking about of some of the more uproar experiences that have happened on college campuses in the last year. My understanding and awareness and conversation with, with students on those campuses is that it's not just like this thing happened. It's there were other things that led to kind of like, this is the final straw. And so it, it's, I, I don't like the, the, terminology when people describe some uh, cases is like this is a high profile uh, sexual assault because all instances of sexual assault are life changing experiences that nobody asked for. Mm -hmm. And so um, all of them matter. And some of them that are getting some of this more significant attention, I do think is based on students being like enough is enough. <laughs> and uh, so men being able to take some inventory of if that were your chapter, would people be surprised? Would people be in that mentality of like, yeah, people have thought that we were a certain way or were aggressive or were people that set up experiences um, like our parties that were unsafe or were known to be um, a, a more like dominant organization on our campus that uh, maybe isn't seen as a group of, of folks who always have the best intentions or are always uh, talking positively about women. Um, and so I, I think if fraternities aren't having that conversation until it's happening on their campus and is the group next door to them or down the street, then I, I don't know how much will change from that if they're just waiting for, for it to be somebody else and not their group. So how is that conversation then a part of your experience as a fraternity of the way that then my experience being somebody who's worked with fraternities before as well, right? Like fraternities often pride themselves on being gentlemen, on being like, right, this, this language of uh, being able to promise that like their house would be the safest place for women, right? Because there are people who care about their peers and would look out for them and all of those things. So then how do we actually live up to that? So is it within your private group messages, right? If we're saying things that aren't uh, kind about women or we're saying um, really provocative things or we're saying really degrading things, how are we kind of calling that out in each other? Uh, if we're doing things like cat calling people outside of our houses, the, like all of that creates those frustrating experiences of what it's like to um, be around a group of men and not feel like an equal, not feel like you are safe uh, in their presence. And then when you think about the environments where fraternities and sororities are often together, to your point, sometimes it involves alcohol, sometimes it's in the context of a party, right? So how are we setting that up? Are we thinking about our themes? Are we thinking about who has access to alcohol? Are we thinking about the spaces in our house that we don't allow people to go into as part of those experiences or how we're making sure folks who are leaving um, are getting safe, safely home and all of those pieces and being that like brother's keeper dynamic um, and also identifying if somebody in your chapter continues to just think it's a joke or doesn't seem to be at the same tone as other folks maybe there's a conversation that can be had that can create um, some buy-in from him, or maybe there's not. And then maybe that's not the person to have in your chapter. If, if there is this thought of like, well, if that were our chapter, it would be X, Y, Z, then that person probably shouldn't be in the chapter. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot that, that men can do. The other piece to your point about this being a topic on college campuses that has had some uproar, Colleges and universities are off, are also trying to manage, like how do they communicate to their students? And I think some colleges and universities are doing a great job um, and some are struggling to find what the wording is because violence like that is really hard to prevent because it comes down to people not doing that. Um, and there's only so many ways you can ask, don't do that, uh, make better choices, right? Um, but if there's language that's coming out from a campus that's being criticized, for the men to look at who is criticizing it. If it's women that are saying like, well, why would the answer to this be, then don't walk alone at night? <laughs> or why would the answer be, don't be talking on a phone if you're walking 
when it's dark out, pay attention, go straight from your car into your house, right? Like all of those kinds of messages of how to reduce your potential to be assaulted. Can they be the ones also vocalizing? Well, what would it look like if we flipped this, the script of who we're talking to about preventing this issue um, and focused on uh, perpetrator behavior rather than on just protection behavior for yourself? And can they also amplify those voices that are criticizing it um, and understand where that's coming from? And so I do think that's continual conversation and education and effort. And they're capable. Men are totally capable of having these conversations and fraternities have all of those foundational pieces within what they say they believe is an organization. So it's making that actionable and calling it out when behavior doesn't align. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic answer. Um, you know, I'll also throw in that a lot of the answers uh, to any problems within a fraternity or sorority also goes back to recruitment, right? So are we recruiting the right types of men that actually reflect the values of the organization? So if we're in SAE, we're talking about a gentleman. If we're in Sigma Pi, we're talking about chivalry. You know, these are words that are embedded in all fraternities. And so the question is, are these people that we're inviting in, do they really reflect that value? And if we're seeing one member that basically is acting, you know, inappropriately, then are or do we have a system of accountability that we can then go and fix that or remove that member because he no longer reflects the values of the organization. And then I think, you know, obviously there is a Title IX office at all of these campuses. So making sure that you get the training that you need within your chapter and then starting to do some peer-to-peer -peer education and having fraternity men be an active role in that. So, you know, looking at consent and how we can create a consent culture on a college campus and bystander intervention training. Um, so what are we gonna do when we're at a social event and we see uh, a couple of people that are clearly intoxicated going up to the second floor of the fraternity house where there are bedrooms. What are we going to do about that if we're sitting there and we're looking and watching this happen in front of our eyes? So I think, um, you know, the answer is spot on there and uh, just reach out and get the training that you need, I think is the most critical thing that I can say, um, you know, to make sure that we prevent this from happening in the first place. So, yeah. And when that training is provided, like show up. Yeah. <laughs> I think and a lot show of up. Says, those programs, those educational opportunities are dominated by women. Yeah. Um, and I think that fits the narrative of where there is sometimes a perception that's a women's issue. So right. absolutely. Now listen, that's why I love to talk about it because I want to change the narrative. And I do think that men take their cues from other men. So I want men to be on the forefront of this issue, talking about it um, and explaining what a real fraternity man is. Um, so I think that that's helpful. And I think, you know, the more men that we have um, that are participating in this actively and teaching it to other people, I think the better that we're going to become. So, um, and then of course, the last piece, hazing is a really big issue within fraternity and sorority life today. We've had hazing deaths every year since 1961. We had an exception in 2020 during the pandemic, but then we're right back to hazing deaths in 2021. So how do we finally get rid of hazing? from our fraternities and sororities? Uh, yes, and I wish I wish I had the magic bullet answer on that one as well. Um, and again, when I think about that um, foundationally, about 50% of students coming into college have experienced hazing before, at least one hazing incident, typically in the high school setting. So when I think about the idea of folks that in high school who maybe have experienced hazing, who are part of um, sports teams or bands or choirs or other like special student organizations in their high schools, those then sometimes become the people who are interested in fraternity sorority because they're the folks who are familiar with the team concept or the organizational uh, connectedness experiences. And so having an, an awareness and an understanding that our organizations have folks who have also already experienced hazing, um, either on a receiving end of it, or perhaps have been people who have been facilitating the hazing dynamics. And so I, I do hope that in, in the future, hazing education at the high school level, at the middle school level will be a more normalized topic in our school system. I, I don't know that I know of many high schools that have that as part of their curriculum. And so, in terms of then what do we do with that when when we're at the fraternity sorority level in a college setting i think i think there are things that we can do and so part of that is hazing education is sometimes focused on the new members of this is what your experience is supposed to be like this is what shouldn't happen to you this is what to look out for 
and that's great, but also then what is the hazing education that's happening with the initiated members? And then how is the information that's being given to them being given to the new members so that they understand here is what the initiated members were told and what then you should be expecting from them. And then understanding if that's not what's happening, here's who you should tell in the chapter, or here's who you should tell on the advisory board, or here's who you should tell at the university or at the national organization level. Um, but making that that culture of active conversation known and clear of, of what it is and what the standard is in a chapter uh, to prevent it. I will also say, right, like chapters have ha already have experiences where it, whether it be little age hazing or big age hazing is already a part of the fabric of their chapter experience. And so as folks step into leadership roles, uh, new members are recruited, those kinds of things, those moments always are prevent presenting opportunities for folks to be thinking about, are we taking an evaluation and inventory of all of the things we do as a chapter to say, hey, maybe this isn't right, or maybe this idea of like the way it's always been, which can be established after about four months, is the way it's always been really the reality of the what our organization says it should be, or are we hearing messaging that's saying something shouldn't be happening, and do we need to open our ears to that and be willing to talk about it? And I think from the advisor lens, from the fraternity sorority, campus professional lens, the headquarters lens, also being open to students bringing that information forward and having conversations about how they can work through it without moving into like, well, now there has to be punishment or reprimand based on these things that have occurred for folks who are willing to talk about it. So I think all of that has to go hand in hand. The All of the focus and conversation about um, legislation related to hazing, I do think is a helpful piece to this as well. Mm -hmm. As students are learning more about changes being made to their state laws, uh, conversations happening at that federal level about what standards might be related to folks who choose to engage in facilitating hazing behaviors is is part of this as well and understanding that this is this is something that can lead to these significant outcomes the ultimate tragedy right can could be a factor that that's there and so needing to look from all angles of how do we get to a point to where hazing plays less and less and less of a role within our organizations and the challenge to that is that hazing exists in lots of different ways at lots of different points of, of age and life. And so really, really taking a critical look at where does hazing come in and, and how is it sometimes glamorized? How do we reduce that and all of the influence that that has on fraternities and sororities, but us not dismissing like, well, but it happens in bands. It happens in choirs, it ha right? Like owning, but it does happen in fraternities and sororities and everyone should be evaluating are there things within our experience that lead to um, potentially being a hazing behavior or being like a seniority based behavior that may cause future problems? And how do we address those things? How do we reduce maybe whatever level we're currently at to get to a place where it's less and less and less of a role? Because none of our organizations are founded on hazing on that. We're founded on these things of how we work together and have collective experiences and develop as people. And that can't happen when um, we say one thing at chapter meeting and then something else happens after the chapter meeting, you know, behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely excellent. I really, really like that a lot. Um, you know, as we're talking about, um, you know, these hazing deaths, um, man, you know, I wish that there was a way that we can put a halt to it because it does seem to be this recurring issue that keeps going on. But I like the education that you talked about, not only to the new members, but to the existing members. I think sometimes we lose sight of that um, and we're not educating all the way through senior year. And then I'll take it a step further to say that maybe it's also embedded in the culture within the alumni as well. So maybe we need to be educating right. the alumni in order to have an impact on uh, the undergraduates, but you're totally right. I'm not aware of anybody in the high schools that are really talking about this um, on a big level. And so many times I have seen hazing behaviors and activity come from the high schools, whether it be the band, the athletics, from a church retreat, and then they bring that into the fraternity or sorority on a college level. And I'm like, where did this come from? This is not in your new member manual. Mm -hmm. And then we find out, well, it was something we did in high school and we brought it to the college level. So you're right in, in essence that 
we almost need to start shifting and educating even earlier before they even come to a college campus because of some of those statistics that you shared where 50% of students are hazed and many of them before they even got to college. So, um, so many issues, so many different ways to look at this. Um, we've also worked on membership reviews together. So talk to our audience a little bit about when a membership review is typically used and is that something that chapters should proactively assess from time to time on their own without an external factor coming in and mandating it. Yeah. Oh, membership reviews. Um, I, in my experience, membership reviews typically come from a place of there is um, maybe like one significant thing that has happened, or there is a growing repeated thing that's happening that after like an initial evaluation of the situation, there comes to be an understanding that maybe this is this has deeper roots than realized, or perhaps there's there's more wides, widespread um, participation or agreement or um, willingness to be a part of of those kinds of problematic behaviors, and there is a need to evaluate and pause the at the time of, of other chapter operations, things that are going on to say, do we have the right people on the bus with us? Do we have the right members who are helping us achieve the things we want to achieve and are bringing out the best in each other um, to, to achieve the, their own goals? And how do we take inventory of that and then make decisions about what the membership should look like moving forward? So membership reviews can take place by um, folks from like a national organization staff or might be an external hired consulting party to come in and uh, facilitate that that process and my experience is membership reviews are truly conversations <laughs> they are attempts to have a dialogue with a with a member a individual and to understand what has been their experience are they willing to talk openly and honestly about what that experience has looked like where there have maybe been times that they um, didn't agree with what was going on or can understand why they would be concerned about something that maybe is taking place or something that's an ongoing issue what's their willingness to buy into change uh, and to be a part of perhaps a, a new tra uh, trajectory for their chapter experience um, and so those pieces play a big role in what those conversations look like but it's truly an, an opportunity to get to know the members and and to get to a place of how do we make sure we've got the right people uh, knowing that as I like to say, sometimes we have to forgive some things from the past and acknowledge that membership reviews aren't necessarily always built around uh, specific like individual outcomes based on a specific incident, but really about making sure we've got the right people in the chapter to move forward. And so then um, membership reviews at the end kind of come to this place of assessing all of the conversations and, and making recommendations around how the organization should move forward, which can result in some members uh being offered the opportunity to continue to move forward in a chapter and sometimes being told that their experience with the organization has ended perhaps indefinitely perhaps until they have graduated from that college or university and then can move forward as as an alum of that organization um but really trying to to implement that pulse check that unfortunately comes at um a time where that's kind of a last resort at, at some points for for chapters of um, saying we've got to get the right people uh, to make sure that we can move forward in a direction that's aligned with the organization experience of what the experience is supposed to be. To your question about whether or not chapters should be doing that on their own. Well, the way I, I think about that is membership is an active experience every day where we make choices that um, contribute to our organization contribute uh, to how we align with what we say we believe in or perhaps take away from those things. And every day is not gonna be perfect, but I do think chapters should be using their accountability measures in their chapter when members fall short. So it doesn't get to this life support moment of now how do we assess and address um, behavior and engagement of the past months or years or whatever of that member's lifetime in the organization um, to have those check-in moments of, hey, you misstepped. So how can we re-corral and move forward? So I, I think that, your membership is kind of always under review, right? As this is something that we make an active commitment to, to be a part of and to engage with every day. Um, so I, I do think that there is definitely a role for the accountability structure within the organization and chapters who are not utilizing it or are not utilizing it consistently are not setting themselves up for success when it comes to being able to manage the behaviors um, that negatively impact the chapter experience as they come up rather than waiting until kind of like 
this more dire moment of, of what are we going to do? Um, because what's currently happening is not the right culture of what should be happening to make people be at their best. A great explanation. And I hope that more chapters are doing some of this work on their own in terms of accountability with the judicial board and having their peers figure out what to do when brothers or sisters act out of line. And really, we want that accountability from a chapter level. We don't necessarily want uh, the university or the headquarters mm -hmm. or some external being to come mm -hmm. in and do this review for you. Ultimately, healthy chapters have this process that already goes on in a judicial board type setting. So um, hopefully, you know, chapters will be healthy and they'll do this stuff on their own. I will say this. I mean, you and I have been on a ton of these membership reviews and many of them are very successful. But I think the most mm -hmm. successful chapters are the ones where they do it themselves. They have this process. And if uh, something happens, they have a process to adjudicate this in a way that's beneficial, not punitive, but more educational for their brothers and sisters to have a new approach uh, in terms of their behavior and their activity. So anyway, but I think that's fantastic. Um, one last piece that I wanted to check in with you because I know you love talking about recruitment and it can be really difficult right now during the pandemic, if we're honest, and people are just scared of getting sick. They're scared of gathering in large groups. Anxiety is at a record high right now. So what's your advice to chapters who aren't seeing the recruitment numbers that they want right now? Yeah. Well, I think some of the good news in, in that is that many folks have become very comfortable with the virtual engagement opportunities and, and doing things um, in a virtual setting rather than in person based on whatever their preference or their guidance of you know, local state guidelines around what they can or can't do in person. So really maximizing um, the virtual piece, I think, is a huge opportunity um, that some chapters are, have really you know, risen to the occasion on. And so when it comes to the recruiting piece of, of this kind of era, I think First, working with your members to do some mind uh, name jogger activities of like who on our campus, right, like might be great candidates. Sure, I think there's something to be said about um, the role of, of making good choices about who we're recruiting based on what our standards are, what our expectations are of membership. So that may not mean every person on your campus is going to be the right fit, right? But growth is a good thing in fraternity and sorority. That is a good thing that we have going of, we've got this great thing that we can share with people. So bringing in new people into that fold is an awesome thing that shouldn't stop um, just because we're worried about having to do that virtually or in a way that maybe feels different than a typical recruiting format. So working with your members to do some mind joggers of, of names of who do you sit next to in class that's really great? Who are you in a student organization with that you think is wonderful but just isn't a part of a fraternity sorority yet? and building out a names list and having some goals around how many folks would you like to see on your names list, knowing that not all of those people are going to be your people. Um, and how many folks would you like to see yourself recruit, right? Like having those goals and those checkpoints can help us, you know, be action oriented then and how are we going to get there rather than just having this open ended mindset of, gosh, I think we need to recruit this semester. So let's just figure it out. Right. So putting those goals in place. And then knowing maybe you have members right now who are a little burnt out and aren't necessarily your folks who are able to help and provide that 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 space to being a part of like a recruitment effort right now. And then you probably have members who are really excited about the recruitment piece. That is their jam. That is the piece of their experience that they really love. So work with your chapters to identify a team of people who can be your recruiters, who can be the people who are having the Zoom calls or virtual meetups, what have you, with folks who might be good fits for your, your organization and, and work with that team to, to facilitate the process so that you're kind of dividing and conquering the work and not just seeing it as this, this big cliff of like, oh, we have to recruit and where do we start and how do we do this? Um, I think not being afraid to like post on social media, knowing that that's a medium in which lots of people are engaged with. Um, and so posting on your stories, posting on grids, right? Like encouraging and welcoming the idea of, of new folks coming into your experience and allowing that to be um, an open channel with other peers on your campus. And you might be surprised at who reaches out to you, um, but certainly would encourage recruitment to be going on all the time and taking advantage of that in, in whatever organization you're in, whatever council you're in. Um, and not seeing this as, well, then we just need to stop or we have to wait until it's, you know, quote unquote normal again and can recruit in the way that we're used to, but allowing this to be a moment of creativity. Wonderful. Hopefully everybody listening is going to be recruiting all the time, yeah. not just the first couple of weeks of school. <laughs> right. 
And hopefully you have a system like Emily Rose is describing with a names list. You really have to be specific and target students that go to school on your campus that are not affiliated and then see where that conversation goes. But if you're just hoping and praying they're going to show up uh, without a real plan, without putting together a names list of who you're targeting, I'm telling you, it, it is a much, much more difficult uh, road that you're on. So get that names list together, start that brainstorming that we're talking about, those mind joggers that Emily Rose is talking about, throw all those names together and then spread that work evenly throughout the chapter. It is not the recruitment chair's responsibility when we don't get the number of people that that we want or the quality of the people that we want it's everybody's responsibility so i hope and pray that uh, you will look at it that way now i know you're back in tennessee now which is absolutely yes. fantastic news for me uh, so what are your favorite local restaurants so i can go and check that out yeah oh my goodness so one that's very close to where i live that i've enjoyed going to is as a nice like lunch spot and a good place to do a pickup as well is so cali taco shop so great, like, um, like chips and cheese, uh, taco salads, burritos, right? The whole thing. So that's a great local place right by me. Um, I also really love Red Bicycle, um, a local coffee place that's in the middle Tennessee area. And they also have such great breakfast options, uh, some savory, some sweet options. Um, so those are two that are really close to me that I like. And then I also, I know I'm giving you more than you, you asked for, but you know, food, I love it too. And yes. um, the alley on main is, is another great place for lunch, dinner kind of has an assortment of things, some great appetizers and, um, cool atmospheres some outdoor space. So, um, those are some places I've, I've enjoyed going to and frequenting since being back the past several months. Nice. Well, you started out with tacos, so you had me yeah. right away. Like you immediately had me in. So that sounds fantastic. I can't wait to check out the SoCal Taco Shop and uh, get some uh, some tacos. That sounds fantastic. So if our listeners have more questions for you or if they want to reach out to you about the various initiatives that you work on to grow Greek life and also to make it safer, where should people go to connect with you? Yeah, well, I'm happy to connect on social media. I know that can be a great quick way to make connections and introductions with folks. So I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Emily Rose Jacobson. Um, and then also happy to chat via email. Um, Emily R. Jacobson at gmail.com. Happy to connect. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all your time today. This has been absolutely fantastic. To our listeners, make sure that you like Emily Rose and her interview. Make sure you share this interview with other students on campus. And thank you so much for everything that you've done within fraternity and sorority life. Um, I just love everything about you. I love your harm reduction angle. And uh, I think that our community is better because of your work. So thank you, Emily Rose. Thank you so much. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us. And we will see you on a future episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks again. Bye-bye.